Wrap me in bacon, wrap him in bacon, and pour bacon crumbles on my head. Pour bacon crumbles on his head. Now that I think of it, I'll just go to Little Caesars. I'll go to Little Caesars. Get a bacon wrap, deep deep dish pizza instead. Get a bacon wrap, deep deep dish pizza instead. Get a Little Caesars large, hot and ready bacon wrap, deep deep dish pepperoni and bacon pizza wrapped in over three and a half feet of bacon for just twelve bucks at participating locations plus tax. Pizza, pizza. Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I am your host, Alex Greenwood. Thanks for checking us out. Here we are again. Episode... Oh my goodness, what episode are we on now? It seems like forever since we last spoke, although I know that the last time we spoke, we spoke about the unfortunate um, hurricane damage that was being done to the setting of many a pile, uh, John Pilot uh, story and book, Key West, and uh, the adjoining environs. We talked about that quite a bit. That was episode 29, and well, here's episode 30. I'm so excited, and in just a moment, we've got a great guest. We've uh, known him to uh, uh, grace us with his presence and humor and great insights about writing many a time. Jason McIntyre will be joining us shortly. I wanted to do a couple of house cleaning things while we were getting started here. First thing, um, I know at the end of that last episode, uh, episode chapter 29 as I call it, that I had mentioned that we would talk about the F word on the next episode. And we're not going to talk about the F word, the F word being failure. We're going to talk about how failure has actually encouraged and inspired me to go on as a writer and in many other aspects of my life because frankly I failed way more than I've succeeded. But You know, it's not going to be a downer. We're going to do that one. It's going to be, I think, a good look into the the ways that creative failures can create some pretty spectacular um, results when you pick yourself up and keep moving. In fact, we might even ask our guest a little bit about his greatest failure. Maybe he'll think about that while we're talking. Again, don't forget, you can follow me, Alex Greenwood. J. Alexander Greenwood, the pen name, but you can call me Alex on Twitter at at A underscore Greenwood. And don't forget the John Pilot Mysteries Facebook page. Just look for John Pilot. That's P-I-L-A-T-E, Mysteries on Facebook. And the mothership, Mysterious Goings On, is actually at pilotscross.com. That's P-I-L-A-T-E-S-C-R-O-S-S.com. And you'll find our blog and our store. If you want autographed John Pilot merch, you can order it right there at a low, low price. Holidays are upon us almost. It's almost Halloween time, as a matter of fact. So you want to get some autographed books to give to grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles. Just give it to somebody you love. Well, then again, if you don't love them, maybe it's a good idea. I don't know. So I'm hearing something, and I think it's got to be our guest, Jason McIntyre. Well, well, come in. Hi. Did you order a pizza? I did. Does it have Canadian bacon? Of course. That's all I bring is Canadian bacon and maple syrup. <laughs> I don't put the maple syrup on the pizza, though. Don't like that. Jason McIntyre, welcome back to Mysterious Goings On. Why, thank you. I appreciate you having me back. Yeah, just to let everybody know a little bit about you, you're the number one Kindle suspense author, ranked number one for the Night Walk Men. You've had bestsellers on The Gathering Storm and Shed, plus the multi-layered literary suspense of Thalo Blue. Your short fiction has appeared in numerous magazines and won several awards. But again, his debut novel, On the Gathering Storm, is cited by readers as a, quote, uncomfortably thrilling, unquote, read. And it's earned McIntyre a spot in the top 20 debut authors for the Goodreads Choice Awards. Dag, man. You That's could... a very fine introduction. I appreciate that, and I think I have to stuff my head it's back a... into this little al- spot here. It's almost as if you'd read it, you wrote, written it yourself. But the, you can find more about Jason, by the way, at thefarthestreaches.com. I know Jason doesn't update that every day, but there's plenty of great info about Jason and all his work, and also his graphic design work and some other stuff, some really good stuff. So, Jason, okay, all that out of the way. Welcome back. Hey, how you been, buddy? You doing okay? I'm doing well. I'm trying to put books out. Many, many, many books. 
More mm. books than people want to read, apparently. <laughs> um, well, yeah, no, I've, I've been I've been very busy as as you have, um, fighting the good fight, writing the good word. Some of them better than others, you know. Actually, as we record this session, you are just days away from the release of your latest novel, Unwed. Correct. Correct. Unwed comes out on Friday, October the twenty seventh. Uh, it's available for pre order now. At uh, a discounted price of ninety nine cents, cheaper than coffee, I think. Good gravy! That's a bargain at five times the price. Depending on how good your coffee is, it's a pretty decent price for a, a shorter novel. It's it's not uh, it's not a five hundred pager, but uh, probably be a one hundred and eighty to two hundred pages in print form. It's available in ebook format only. It's exclusively at Amazon uh, to start with. There will be a print version later. Unwed is kind of a unique way to present a, a, a book. It's a part of a mosaic novel. Currently, there's eight titles available in this larger mosaic work. Each book of the eight has their own main characters and their own plot line, their own beginning, middle, and end. You can read one book. You can read two books. You can read three books. You'll get three complete stories if you read three books. You don't have to read them in order. You don't have to start at the beginning. Unwed, which comes out Friday, uh, October the 27th, is the sixth book chronologically. But that doesn't matter. You don't have to read the fi first five because they all have different stories and different characters that feed into a larger mosaic of what's happening in this particular setting with this large cast of characters. Well, when you mention the setting, it's Dovetail Cove. What is Dovetail Cove? Can you give us a little background on what it is, where it is, how it is, and when it Do is? Dovetail Cove uh, is kind of was a, a, a thriving town in the 50s and 60s, a tourist place on a small island. Um, and it's, it's much like your own neighborhood or the town where you grew up. It's, there's gossipers. There's there's way too many churches for the number of people that live there. Um, the population swells with tourist activity. When we catch up with it, it's the 1970s, and it's suffering kind of an economic meltdown. The, the uh, power plant has gone out of business. The mine has shut down. Workers are leaving. Um, the main economy is probably fishing and lobster and that kind of thing. Um, so we have a, an interesting mix of well-to-do folks and those that are kind of on the lower spectrum you know close to poverty so it offers a great chance to kind of visit all the different aspects the you know society in a microcosm if, it were, if that's okay and it's interesting because while the the fictional town on the island is technically canadian it's populated as well with lots of americans and the overriding genre is kind of americana if i if i may like a gothic uh, horror literature kind of a feel for the town and, and these stories you know i've read numerous pieces of the puzzle of this mosaic i've read several of the dovetail cove novels including i received a artist proof or a it's not an artist proof but i received a, a proof manuscript of unwed uh, which wow we'll get to that in a moment but uh, it's interesting when i first went into this just reading a little bit about them, I thought, well, whoa, is this like a kind of a Twin Peaks kind of thing, this place? But I guess it, you can make some of those kinds of comparisons. But frankly, uh, my, my major criticism of Twin Peaks, I love the atmosphere, but I think the stories are kind of weird for weird sake a lot of the time. And that's not what you find here in Dovetail Cove. And what I love, too, about is the clever punnage going on with Dovetail Cove. All the books dovetail into one another. I'm sure that wasn't intentional, but I, I love I love that, and I love the the aesthetic, the visual aesthetic that the the, the the words evoke within me. I love the way you can see these these characters, and I think you hit it on the head when you said that firing to kind of uh, capturing these snapshots of Americana type settings, of, and you fully inhabit a lot of these characters in such a way that. Even though you don't go overboard on describing how they look, in fact, you, you rarely did go into appearances at all, but just their dialogue and their thought process and their actions, they they instantly plug in a lot of the time for me into these archetypes that I actually know from real life 
having lived in small town. It's very successful in that way because the reader doesn't have to spend a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to figure out who these people are. You can just get into the story. You, you get in there, and it's really superb in that regard. It's, it's clear that you've put a lot of work into the characters. Well, thank you. That, that is my hope. And to be honest, this idea of archetype characters appeals to me. I, I like looking at everyday life that you and I and, and many people take for granted in a way, and then kind of breaking those archetypes or breaking those stereotypes down and looking at the, the layers underneath the sur surface of the onion, not just with the characters, but with the setting and, and, and the plot itself. A lot of times my goal is take something fairly mundane mm -hmm. and really look at it underneath and see why it's more interesting or turn it upside down and, and make it uh, more upsetting. So right. in Unwed, we open with Bexy McLeod, who has three grown children that have left the island. Two of them, the two boys, have gone off to become lobster fishers, and the daughter has had her own uh, traumatic experience, and she's now left her mother behind. Bexy's in a wheelchair, and Bexy, uh, um, we don't know exactly why yet, but Bexy's returning to her church, her former Catholic church, and we don't know why, but she hasn't been back in at least four years, possibly longer. And to me, that's interesting. Going to church is a very mundane activity for many people uh, of different faiths. They go every Sunday. Why now would we be interested in, in, in Bexie's situation that she hasn't been in or hasn't felt that she's been welcome? So to me, that's, you know, on the surface, that's a fairly mundane beginning. But my hope is that readers will quickly be asking, well, why hasn't she been? And that's very much at the, at the center of Unwed. Um, why hasn't she been to church? And what is now going to go on now that she's back right. in that church in Dovetail Cove? Yeah, and um, what I like, too, about the, the series, such as, I mean, it's, it's weird to call it a series because it's really not sequential. But it is a series, and then it takes, for simplicity's sake, we'll call it a series. How about that? I mean, you've even, sure. right? I call it uh, the series that's not a series, because readers want series. They like series. They they understand what that is. Um, this one is different, but for the purposes of, of maybe selling it or appealing to, to those that love series, I've kind of pushed it into that mold a little bit by sequentially numbering them. Initially, there was going, going to be no sequential numbering whatsoever right but i found that readers they they wanted a starting point some mm -hmm. of them um, others have jumped in and read along as i've released them out of order because as one reader says i'm devious <laughs> you, you really are i try not to play favorites on in the the books you know i've read and many of them i haven't read them all looking back and thinking i've, I've read um, bled and redhead and zed and unwed and shed You've read most of them. I think, wow, oh my gosh, I think I have. I've read, I think the, read? Only, the only one I haven't read is uh, Fled, I guess. I think so, and you've read Dread as well. Have I read them all? There's no way. You've read them all except for Fled, yes sir, you have. That's it, yeah, Fled's the one I haven't read. Or you're, or you're a really convincing liar. Well, no, I, I definitely have, but you know, <laughs> here's the thing, uh, you may have noticed a, a theme here, they, they all, the titles all have the Ed sound in them. Yes, and there is not a single book called Ed, and there is not a single book called Ted. Hmm. But I, I, I don't, uh, I don't rec recuse myself from the responsibility of possibly having some, some rhyming characters in there eventually. Uh, that, that I think that would be only natural. They're great too, in the sense that not, they're not all the same. If you were to, okay, if we're going to take this into, what genre are these books? Well, I, mm. I, I, I hate to break it to you, folks, but. Each book is a different genre, basically. I mean, th they're linked together, but I mean, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me, tell me if I'm being a little too on the nose about that. No, you're you're right, spot on, and that's that's good. Um, out of eight books, and there's going to be a ninth and a tenth. It was kind of designed, for lack of a better word, not that I really design what I'm going to write, but but in in my mind as I was going through it and discovering how I could tell this bigger story, and I came up with this idea of writing them in smaller pieces. It kind of became a bit of a playground for me, for lack of a better word. I wanted to write a bunch of different kinds of genres before I 
kicked the can. And this model that I kind of came up with afforded me the opportunity to do that. So, I mean, we have, um, just glancing here at the list, we have a fairy tale. We have a psychological suspense. We have a noir kind of crime drama. We have what I would loosely call a romance. Unwed is kind of a soap opera. It has those elements to it. We have kind of a classic damaged hero horror story. And we have what I, I sometimes call a murder mystery in reverse. Now, they're all my style. They don't break from my style very much. But they do borrow from some of these genres quite heavily in their structure, in their language, um, and and in what they're really about. And for me, that was just a tremendous ton of fun to be able to jump from genre to genre while still retaining, you know, the suspense and the the uh, the horror and suspense. Uh, pardon me, horror, suspense, and thriller elements that everybody kind of expects. Those are all pretty much present in everything. Right, but it, what I love about it too is, in particular, if you're new to the series now, you have eight books now. You can you can dive in. I've been reading them kind of as they went along, so there was spaces between, you know, each book. Uh, whereas you know, you can read each piece of the mosaic and put it together if you were to read them all. You know, not when I say sequ sequentially, I mean pick any way you want. But you could go get all eight books right now, and. That's a good point. Um, with the release of Unwed on Friday, the 27th of October, the first eight books, if, you, if we're looking at them chronologically, the first eight books will then be available. So if you wanted to read them in chronological order, they start in 1971, 72, 73, 74, up to 70, 1978. Each book happens in its own year. So we can even look at it that way. But again, you don't have to go that route. You can pick anyone that appeals to you. Uh, and start there, and if and if you enjoy it, pick up another one, you know, because you'll get a bigger story. You'll get more clues as to what the heck is going on here. Right. And then the, the tenth book is going to pull a lot of these favorite characters back that readers over the last, uh, let's see here, five, six years since I've been publishing this series that's not a series, the readers have told me, I, I like this character. I This character better not die. Please don't kill off so-and-so. Many of those characters, some of them did die. Sorry. <laughs> but many of those characters that are still with us will be back for that 10th book. Oh. And some of them that did die, you know, they might actually reappear as well. So, you know, stay tuned for that. That's so cool. There is so much to recommend these books. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also the very vivid covers, the cover art, which I believe you, did you do all of them? I've done all of them, yes. Um, it's one of the things I do for other authors as well. I, I, I design book jackets, both print and ebook. I also do advertising uh, graphic design for social media and, and print if, if that's a need. Yeah, if people listening to this now wanted to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to help you out with graphic design for your book. I tend to do, you know, slightly unusual designs. I, mm -hmm. I try not to follow the tropes. Not just with my writing, but with the things I design, I want to create something that stands out on the shelf for authors and their readers. So, yes, and I've done all of all of Dovetail Co covers as well. Yeah. If you go to Amazon.com and the links in the show notes, by the way, um, to the pre-order for Unwed, and you can go from there. You click on Jason's name, and you can go find the series. And by the way, if you hear some noises, we're having some work done here at uh, Stately Wayne Manor, so I apologize ahead of time. I'm hearing the workers. They're starting to install some countertops, which makes me excited. All right, anyway, um, if you want to go to Amazon, go to those links. You can see these very vivid covers. I'm not going to say which of these books is my favorite, but I will tell you I have a favorite cover. Oh, okay. Which and one? I absolutely love Redhead. Yeah, I, it's a very powerful cover. It's gotten, in my opinion, yeah. as a designer, I, I felt like I really hit on something with that design. Well, it yeah. captures a noir feel, and there's some menace and some sex, and but it's just uh, I don't know how. If you're not if you're new to Jason's work, I'll just tell you, it, it, they don't leave you very quickly. Now that's a compliment to a writer, but honestly. It's like when you see a movie and you wake up the next morning and you're still kind of thinking about it or you read a book and it's still with you a few days later. That's, to me, the hallmark of something that that it, it may have disturbed you. And I'm not going to lie. Some of Jason's stuff really disturbs me. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's it's meant to be disturbing. It's the, But 
it's funny because he's been a guest in my home and uh, I really care about him very much as a friend and there, he's got this phenomenal reservoir of darkness that he can tap into and I get I get a little disturbed when I read some of the stuff he does and but these covers are gorgeous and I don't know why you don't enter them in contests because they're fantastic and you would win every time they're just so great well, well thank you for saying that um now it makes me wonder as as a guest in your home how did you sleep at night knowing that this creep was you know in the guest room I, we locked the door yeah i bet i heard the click yeah i thought yeah. you were locking me in and maybe yeah. you were just locking me out of the rest of the I, house i don't know. i contemplated locking you in i i know that but yeah. no it, it uh it's uh it's quite a it's it's quite a imagination, a subconscious, whatever it is that you you can draw upon. It really is. I I appreciate that. I should probably mention at this point. Some some readers I find take what you said just now to mean that there's a lot of adult subject matter. There are mature themes mm -hmm. in some of the books. Um, some of those mature themes drive the plot, drive the characters. I don't have a lot of profanity. No. In my work, there's some, you know, because I think there's a natural way that we speak in in the 1970s, the 80s, the 90s, and up until now. There's, you know, that's it's just the way some of these characters speak that they use four-letter words, etc. But it's not an overabundance, I don't think. No. And there's not an overabundance of graphic violence or no. graphic sex. There are those things to a degree. Um, one of the things that I strive for is... I don't. I don't really want to be a gore meister. I don't want to have blood on the walls, you know, for for what I'm writing. I don't necessarily need to have so much flesh and and sexual tantalization in what I write. I think often less is more. Not to say I don't want to describe the scene fully and and the important aspects of things. I just don't think I would I would be served, and I don't think the story would be served in these books with gratuitous sex violence profanity and that's just the way that i do it so yeah that's that's just something worth mentioning i think well to be clear when i say i've been disturbed and that's that's the thing too i'm i'm clearly not being disturbed by a gratuitous gore fest or a raunchy sex scene i mean there's like you said there, there's plenty of nuance there and there's plenty of um, things that bring it to mind but that's the thing you give us as a reader the ability to formulate our own horrific visions and our own you know ex how an explicit sex scene might look because it looks different to every reader and ostensibly you're going to be uh, with the prompts so to speak from jason's work you're going to be um, creating imagery of a raunchy sex scene or of, of violence or gore that speaks to you jason you just you leave it to the reader which is great so when i say disturbed though you push those buttons quite well because yet without all those things spelled out for you i still carry uh, i still carry the, the the story around with me you know days after i've read it that's the same thing when when with your book of uh, short stories which i've you know i believe you're you can let us know a little bit about that too, but I've read some of your short stories and oh my goodness, I carried some of those around with me. And uh, I'm not the first person to say this, but I, I totally believe this. It's, it's a pity there, there's no Twilight Zone on anymore. I just think you'd be excellent. You'd be an excellent writer, if not showrunner of the Twilight Zone, because you really, you really do nail so many things with your work. You really do. Great storytelling. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's, that's my hope, is that I'm using a, an efficiency of words to hopefully invoke, or evoke, I guess is the word, evoke in a reader some sort of response. Somebody said that uh, one book was guttural or visceral. That's a word that gets thrown around a lot hmm. in indie publishing and big name publishing, visceral. Yeah. I actually, I actually, my hope is to actually write visceral work that actually punches people in the gut without necessarily ripping open a gut if you know what i mean i don't necessarily need a reader to visualize or see blood and guts yeah. to think about heavy repercussions physical repercussions mental repercussions and i love i love 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 when a reader says exactly what you said so i appreciate that that a book stayed with me even though it wasn't you know, like I've said, gore and, and 
ex- extreme fiction in that way. I, th- I like to do the extreme part of the fiction in the reader's head. That's my hope. Right. And if I'm succeeding at that, then I'm firing. I'm firing on all cylinders if I can do that. I think you truly are. It's, it's always exciting to know that there's another Dovetail Cove book on the way. And I'm a little nervous now that I know there's only two left. Well, that's interesting. So 1979, which is the last year of this decade of the 70s and the last year of the decade of um, the Dovetail Cove books, uh, has another book, and my hope is to put that out in November, December. I usually don't um, advertise dates because if, if I don't make them, I don't want to, to set anybody up for expectation and then fail to meet it. I'm fairly certain that the ninth book, 1979, which has a title but it's not revealed yet, will be out uh, November or December. The tenth book is a giant book. It is the longest thing I've ever written because oh. it pulls in all of these characters. So, yeah, it will be the final Dovetail Cove book, but it's going to be, I'm hoping, as long as all the other eight or nine books combined. Almost. Almost. As, as long. Good uh, lord. It's going to take some time to get, you know, final, you know, the final draft and final edits and that kind of thing ready. So I can't, I can't say for sure when. My hope is early next year for that book. But fans don't really like that word but readers of the the series to date who've enjoyed it some of their favorites will be back and i'm hoping they will not be disappointed by the massive conclusion to this story no i think the i think that people if you've read particularly if you've read all of the preceding books that last book is going to be a whopper that you're just ready ready to do it I, i'm excited too because you know i've not uh, you typically write novellas or very or shorter novels, as you said, or short stories. So I'm really interested to see, you know, this really, you know, this epic book that you've 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 come up with. And it, so is it all done? Are you basically? Or is the series done? In your, I mean, is it done? I don't. I don't mean is it all published? Obviously, it's not. But is it all done? It's done. Yeah, I've written the final. You know, the final V end on the tenth and last book of Dovetail Co. Wow. Uh, some of them. Some of the the. 10 are novels, full-length novels. They're a little shorter than, than say, a Stephen King work or something. It tends to <laughs> right. write long books. Um, uh, but yeah, within this world, many of them are, are considered a novella, which is le- less than 50,000 words. Mm-hmm. For some readers, they're not going to know what that means. That that would be less than 150 pages, maybe, Yeah, um, considered a novella. So, yeah. Uh, and then the 10th, yeah. It's uh, it's ginormous, and it's finished. It's it, it's got to go through the process of publication, though, right? Which, as you know, Alex, includes, you know, proofing, uh, well, before all of that, editing, extensive edi- editing, uh, beta reading, which is where you send out, where an author or, or writer will send out preview copies um, to a, a group of trusted confidants and readers and, and, and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> Alex just put up his hand. Um I would love it if you pre-read the book, Alex. I want to. Find all my mistakes. That's the other thing that's tricky. I'm writing about a decade that I barely know, right? I was I was born into the decade of the 70s, but I have no conscious memory of the 70s. So there is a ton of research that goes into this. There's there's things that I've gotten wrong that beta readers have corrected. You know, rotary telephones and, and you know, different uh, technological advancements, songs that weren't actually released yet. You know, those kinds of things can be looked at quickly. But there's a kind of a, a gut memory that people who lived through a time have that somebody who didn't can't always get right. Um, so I count on beta readers to help me with some of those things because some of them are older than I am, and I, that's not I'm not poking anybody in this room. But uh, but I I've had a, just a tremendous time playing in this era of the '70s. It was a simpler time, no smartphones, you know. That's a that's a huge challenge with writing oh, tell me about it. history fiction in 2017 is the smartphone. You can find out anything on a smartphone in your pocket. How can you write suspenseful stuff it's well like... <laughs> without, you know, if books didn't have suspension of disbelief now in 2017, they'd only be five pages long because people would just, you know, call up the other character and say, well, the killer's on his way. Uh, but of course, in 1976, you can't you can't do that as easily. So there's a bit of leeway, more leeway, I find. 
I think I've spoken previously about that in my John Pilot mystery series. A lot of it takes place uh, in Cross Township, which has had a devil of a time getting good cell service. <laughs> That's because it takes place within the last ten years. So uh, you know, but I've cheated quite a bit. And my my next John Pilot novel, there's basically the smartphone is starting to come into the. I can't hold it off forever. I've just tried right. to cheat and not use it because he's either out on a boat where there's no service or he's you know, back in a small town that has piss poor service. But yeah, the challenges of your research, which are, it's really good because I love the way you, there's just the perfect detail to give it the verisimilitude the story requires so that you, you know, everything from what's on television, you know, to I'm making this part up, TV dinners or whatever, you know, little details like that, that, that give it just that oomph, you know, but you're right. It is challenging. And as I go forward in my series, which for some dumb reason, I said, but there's going to be 12, of these damn things and and i'm only on you, and my you mom, did say that i did oh i've announced that many times oh, there'll be there'll be a uh -huh. dozen i've given interviews yeah and i'm like i'm on book six right now and but i it's gonna it may take the rest of my life but i will get them done unlike you i know i'm not as prolific and i don't i don't write as quickly and um, i've always admired that about you is not only do you write quickly but you write extremely well it's it's exciting and I'm, i wanted to make sure that we as we wrap up here that i told Listeners of Mysterious Goings On about what's going on with you. I could talk to you forever, but I, I know we, we don't want to wear people out, and you've got stuff to do. You've got a, a book to get out, but is there a couple of things you want to remind folks about? And Well, as I said off the top, and maybe perhaps you said it, uh, the latest Dovetail Co. book drops on Friday, October 27th. Up until then, I think there's about uh, three or four days between when we're recording this until uh, Friday the 27th. The pre-order for that book which is Unwed, a Dovetail Cove novel, uh, 1976, is, is available. The pre-order at Amazon.com exclusively. And the pre-order for the ebook is at only 99 cents. And that's a steal because you can get bad coffee for just a little bit less than that. <laughs> or you can get this book for, you know, a few pennies more and be entertained for at least the two hours that it would take you to read it. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the book. Um, it's, it's a bit edgy. Um, there's some mature themes and subject matter in it, as are some of the other books. Um, but I'm really happy that this rounds out the, the first eight books in this series. If people want to learn more about the series, they can go to my website, which is www.thefarthestreaches.com. I don't know. You always spell your website, Alex. I don't know if I should, if I should try it. T-H-E-F-A-R-T-H-E-S-T-R-E. A C H E S dot com. Wow, that's a really long URL. I wouldn't record. I wouldn't do that very often if I were you. I, no, you did no, it well. I think that's the first time I've ever done it, and I didn't read it. Well, I do. I, I, I spell mine because pilot. Nobody, everybody thinks it's Pilates or or pilot, like or a, like, an pilot, pilot. like an airplane pilot. So I have yeah. to spell. It. Yeah, and yeah. So go to go to the farthest reaches. The link will be in the show notes too. Um, you know what I'm going to do though, real quick before, and, and also if they want to get a hold of you, if they're if you're an author and you're interested in, in, a, in a fantastic book cover, how do they get a hold of you? Well, my phone number is no. I'm <laughs> Again, you can go to the farthest reaches. I have a, a page on there called Graphic Design. You can click on that, and that will allow you to send me an email. Uh, if you don't want to do that, and you're on Facebook, I'm at Jason McIntyre on Facebook. Um, also Twitter, it's Jason C. McIntyre on Twitter. You can ping me in any of those places, and I will respond to you and help you out with that um, or tell you uh, a great spinach dip recipe. You know, I'm really, really proud of my spinach dip recipe. Well, uh, it, I'm looking forward to having that. And, uh, and you know, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm gonna have to mention, too, that, uh, folks, I, I put my money where my mouth is. The, the next book in the John Pilot series coming out very shortly was – was created by Jason McIntyre, and I think you're going to love it. It's really exciting and fun, and captures the book. Yeah, it's it's explosive. I'll just say that. Um, and um, yeah, Ooh, nice tease. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm going to leave you with this about Unwed. It's January 1976, and Bexy McLeod gets roped into helping Dovetail Co.'s retired doc as he deals with Saint Dominic's latest problem. Having tangled with the town's church-going community for years. Bexie knows she shouldn't get involved. Wheelchair-bound, after an accident left her paraplegic, she might be the least sensible choice. Trouble tends to follow the widow, and the last thing Bexie needs is confrontation. But now she's finding herself enamored with the young woman she's helping. Bexie may just have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe 
with one of the most prominent members of Dovetail Cove's upper crust and its head priest. In Unwed, a Dovetail Cove novel. I've read it. It's great. It's a great introduction to the series, but you can't go wrong with any of the other seven books. I really recommend it, folks. Jason, anything else before we cut this one loose? Uh, just to mention, there's absolutely no Canadian bacon in my spinach dip recipe. That's really the only thing. If, if listeners can come away from this uh, half hour or however long we've spoken with one idea, it's that Canadian bacon is fantastic, but it does not go in the spinach dip. Yeah, that's true. And a uh, little known secret about my Canadian friend, he doesn't like maple syrup. He gags on it. I do. Um, it's just a personal preference, and uh, quite frankly, I'm tired of everybody sending me maple syrup because I'm Canadian. I, I don't understand. You know, you know, make fun of my accent. That's fine. <laughs> but stop sending the maple syrup. Watch. I'm going to actually get some of you sending me maple syrup or coupons or something. It's hilarious because you live in the land that, that invented it practically, and, and, and yeah. they're sending it to you. <laughs> the maple leaf is right there on the flag. I look at it every day, you know? So, uh, yeah. Oh man, that's hilarious! But, yeah, the irony, right? The irony. It's like, I also hate cold weather too. I don't like that. Um, so yeah, that's that. that's something else. Well, it's yeah, it'd be it'd be like people sending you know me as an American author. I don't know hot dogs or something. I mean, you know, uh, no, I can get them here. It's all good. Yeah, all right. exactly. Well, listen, folks, uh, this has been so fun, Jason. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me back uh, seventy-five times. It's my oh, pleasure. Wait. Only chapter 30. I've only been here 30 times. Yeah, but we'll, we'll get to 75, and we'll have you back again soon. Oh, Jason, one last thing. One last, last thing. What would you consider to be your greatest failure as a writer? Taking bad advice, probably. Uh, early days, and I don't mean early days of writing, but early days of sharing my work, which is, I. it's kind of like uh, two different birth dates. You know, you have a birth date when you start down the path of creating something, and then you have another birth date where you start sharing it. I started sharing uh, writing that I had done and I, t I took some bad advice and some of that advice was t to try and hammer it into a genre. Now, that's tricky because genre work sells. Right. And, and work that it cannot be easily labeled does not sell as easily right away. So when I say it was bad advice, I mean it was bad advice for me to take pre-existing work that I had worked really hard on, and it was as I felt it should be, uh, written in the way that it is, mixing, bending genres, pulling in different different pieces of genres based on my experience as a reader and what I liked and what I was experienced with and what I thought I could write to tell this particular story, and trying to take some of those influences out. You can't do that without affecting the quality of the story, in my view. And I think I damaged some work and shared it and it didn't it didn't do well and people didn't get it because it was lesser it was made lesser by trying to to hammer it that's the word to hammer it into a shape that it wasn't so um and that that hurt me with you know querying to agents and and trying to send to publishers years gone by and it hurt me probably with audiences when i started self-publishing and then later when i did start publishing with with publishers um the work itself wasn't as good if if you try to make it be something that it isn't. Now, if you want to sit down and write a, you know, a specific genre piece, do that. Uh, don't let anybody stop you from writing whatever genre you want to write. If, if Westerns are out of style, but you want to write a Western and you have a great idea and, and you think you can do it, do it. But if your Western has time travel in it and that's the way that you feel that it should be written, do that. And don't let anybody tell you to change it. Now, the, that, there's, there's room for debate on this. Maybe you're trying to get in with a specific publisher or a specific audience, and maybe you're going to tailor towards that. That's fine. That's your choice. For me, bending the work didn't work. Great advice. I love it. Uh, again, from your failures, you can, you can find springboards to success, and you obviously found that success, Jason McIntyre. So thanks again for being here on the show. And to you listeners, thank you for tuning in, so to speak, here on the, the podcast. I could sure use your review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, as they call it now. It's not hard to do. Just uh, go to wherever you download this uh, podcast from and leave a review. Hey, a few stars and a couple of sentences take you all two minutes. No big deal. I'd sure appreciate it, though. It would help keep this show going and will help us get sponsors and maybe help 
defray the cost of putting the show out. Upcoming shows, as I mentioned, the F word is coming soon, and we're going to start being more on a more regular basis as we go into the winter months. I get all cozy in my little writer's nook, and I look for any excuse not to be writing, so I do a lot more podcasting. So I hope you will tune in for that. And um, until next time, my friends, keep reading. Do you like to have your lobes stroked with the best information and analysis of Star Trek Deep Space Nine? Want to learn that Dabo is more than Cam Newton's touchdown dance? Interested in discussions of Clayton Endicott III from Benson morphing into a pail of metallic goo? Then tune in to Audio Umox, the seminal DS9 podcast. Your hosts, Simon Van Gelder and John Christopher, will drink Tranya and discuss life and all things Deep Space Nine, endeavoring to boldly cover all 176 episodes. Download the Umox podcast on iTunes or Google Play today, and make sure to follow Simon and John between episodes on Twitter at at Umox Podcast. That's the at sign, then O-O-M-O-X. P-O-D-C-A-S-T. That's Audio Umox, where an eargasm is only a podcast away. What does your morning sound like? (laughs) (laughs) That's Daddy's little man. Morning, Daddy. Grab your usual from Mickey D's. Here's to making your morning routine a little better with a delicious breakfast from McDonald's. Start your day at McDonald's with a refreshingly bold large McCafe iced coffee for just $2. Price and participation may vary for a limited time. Cannot be combined with any other offer or any combo meal. Hi, it's Jamie, Progressive's Employee of the Month, two months in a row. Leave a message at the... Hi, Jamie. It's me, Jamie. I just had a new idea for our song about the Name Your Price tool. So when it's like, tell us what you want to pay, hey, 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 and the trombone goes, blah, 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 and you say, we'll help you find coverage options to fit your budget. Then we just all do finger snaps while a choir goes, savings coming at ya, savings coming at ya. Yes? No? Maybe? Anyway, see your practice tonight. I got new lyrics for the rap break. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law.